It's great to be here today, to worship, to be encouraged. Um, we're continuing our, or before I dive into that, there's one more announcement I think that wasn't mentioned, which I probably should have told Victor about. Uh, Alex Hizhnyak has gotten married over in Ukraine, so him and his new bride, yes, uh, that happened yesterday, I believe, or however work, the time zones work. Um, so Alex and his new bride, Dasha, will be returning to us in a couple of weeks, but that's another exciting thing, another family added to our, to our community. So we are, um, we're continuing our series on uh, conquering our chaos, right? We're talking about, for the last couple of weeks, uh, a lot of very interesting subjects. Uh, and they're very interesting to us because they're very real to our internal heart battles. We all have struggles inside of our hearts. Our emotions, addictions, all these different things that we've been talking about. And today, uh, we'll focus on one specific emotional experience, right? We had a whole sermon on emotions uh, a few weeks ago. Today, we'll talk about the one specific emotion, maybe probably one of the most powerful emotions that, pr that uh, creates problems in our life, and that is fear and anxiety. Um, this is a problem for all of us. If you're human, you have fears, right? And, and this, this, this specific problem, it, it expresses itself in a variety of different ways, right? And some of them are very interesting. Uh, this story caught my eye when I was pre preparing this week. And, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's about fear. Second of all, it's, it's coming from the town of Sarasota, Florida, which a lot of our friends are down there now, moving. But a few years back, when the town fathers of Sarasota, Florida, announced a proposal to place a few lifelike clowns in town for the kids to enjoy, to make the town maybe feel more like a you know, joyful park, this proposal caused an explosion of, of fear that was hiding in the hearts of many people. When the cholerophobes, or those people who fear clowns, learned that the city officials were about to approve a plan to put 70 life-size fiberglass clowns in the downtown area, they exploded with protest, with calls, with letters to the agencies talking about that how, why this is a terrible and frightening idea. It caused protests in the streets, and obviously the idea was killed. Apparently, uh, the fathers of the town who had this idea to brighten up the kids' moods with clowns in town didn't realize that all around them, actually one in seven people is a cholerophobe or suffers from cholerophobia, a, a debilitating fear of clowns. Personally, I think clowns are a little bit creepy. I don't think they're that fun, but maybe that's part of, uh, part of the culture working on me too. Another interesting example of fears, and you know, we can go all day about interesting and, and maybe funny expressions of fear. Uh, the children's writer Hans Christian Andersen, he was always afraid that he would be buried alive, uh, mistaken for dead and buried alive. And so every night that he would go to sleep, Next to his bed, uh, on the bedside table, was a little note. I may seem dead, but I'm not. I'm just sleeping. And that helped assuage his fear during the night that somebody might think he's dead and bury him. These, these examples, they seem a little bit funny, maybe kind of silly, but the reality is when we zoom out and we, we consider this idea of fear, we realize that fear, it fills our lives, all of our lives. And it fills our lives in a variety of different ways, right? We live in a world, a culture, in many ways, of fear and anxiety. The last year and a half has been obvious proof of that. Um, we live in a world where there's many dangers, right? We understand that we're fragile human creatures. We don't have all power to control the world. We can't prevent all of our fears from, from uh, coming about. We are weak, and, and there's really a lot in the world to be scared of, right? To add to this, in our digital world, with our phones, computers, radio, TV, we are constantly being bombarded by messages of how dangerous the world is, right? Because the news media is trying to make money, 
They, they just want to stay in business. And they realize that um, crazy headlines of the, the, the latest terror attacks, the latest tragedies, the latest catastrophes, that is what people are gravitated towards. That is what makes people click on the story. That is what makes people turn on the TV to see what's happening. Fear sells. Fear sells in the news. Fear sells on TV and movies, right? Because there is something about fear that, in, in a strange, paradoxical way, it, it attracts people because we identify with this universal feeling of being afraid. We fear a lot of things. Some of these things are reasonable. Some of these things are not as reasonable. Being buried alive while we sleep or clowns may be not as reasonable, but we fear what? Health problems. We fear not having enough money. We fear death. We fear that something is bad is going to happen to our loved ones. We feel being rejected or criticized by other people. We fear being alone. We fear being around people. We fear judgment before God. We fear failures and secrets being exposed. We fear, some people fear going to sleep. Some people fear spiders and snakes. Some people are afraid of the dark. Some people have a debilitating fear of germs, war, flying in planes, right? You name it, you can look around, you can pick, and you can find people who suffer with fears of specific things in the world around us, right? A few years ago, I, I probably shared this story in a sermon before, but it's interesting because uh, when we were, me and Victor were doing this class on biblical counseling at, in our seminary, and we had an assignment to pick a um, research paper, to write a research paper on one topic that people struggle with in the counseling world. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll do fear and anxiety because, you know, I'm in youth, and uh, I'm around youth ministry a lot, and a lot of young people today have anxiety problems, and so I want to understand this problem a little bit better so I can help people. And it's interesting because uh, this study, actually, I didn't realize, it exposed many fears inside my own heart. I started out trying to study a problem that I could help others with, I finished up realizing that uh, this is a problem in my own heart that lurks in ways that I did not realize. My, my, one of my biggest fears is um, me not being able to provide and protect for my family, my kids, my wife, something happening to me that I can't be there for them, right? That's one of the things that I realized. But interestingly enough, I, I realized that um, it's not even, for me personally, not death that I fear. If I didn't have kids and a family, I feel like life, you know, we can go and be with Jesus. But, but having loved ones that I personally feel that I need to protect, provide, guide them. It, it, it's one of those fears that was exposed to me. And interestingly, this was a season that was pretty stressful with work, with ministry, with seminary. There was a lot of things going on. And in, in the middle of all this, this season, when I was taking this class and studying fear and anxiety, I was feeling a tingling on my face, side of my face, just kind of like numb, like dentist feeling. And first I dismissed it, thought it was like, oh, whatever, I just felt, slept on my face wrong or something. And the tingling numbness got worse and worse. And then I had this, you know, as a nurse, you, you do these ch different checks on people when they're having different symptoms. And I went into the bathroom, I looked in the mirror, and I smiled. Not truly smiled, but made my face into a fa shape of a smile. And I realized one side was lower than the other. And it was like a shock of electric fear down my spine. What is going on? And over the next couple of days, this numbness got worse and worse and worse, to the point where like half of my face was sagging. It was, it was very, very disturbing. And I go to my doctor. Obviously, I'm doing a bunch of research. What is this? There's a, you know, the, the easiest solution, answers, and then there's the scariest options, brain tumors, all these things, right? What could it be? It could be anything. And my doctor does these little tests, and he is not a very compassionate person. And he's like, yeah, it's probably uh, something called Bell's palsy. It's an inflammation of the facial nerve. We don't really know what causes it. It's like a little virus that makes this nerve inflamed. And um, some people, you give them some medication, anti-inflammatory medication, and it goes away. Some people, it never goes away. Their face is sagging all their life. So we'll see. And I was like, wow, that, that's not very helpful. So there I am, 
trying to anxiously finish my paper on anxiety with half of my face sagging, popping medications, praying that the medication will work. And it was, it was a very, very, it, it's funny in retrospect, but it was a good time when God used to expose my fears and realize, gosh, I am a very, very frightened person on the inside. I have my fears that if you poke them, this anxiety erupts. As we look at the subject, what I want us to do is to see that when we experience fear and anxiety, we want to see that even though this problem is very complex, there's so many ways that this thing works in our hearts, that there is a powerful simplicity to how God answers this question. God does not promise to take us out of our fears. He does not promise to give you immunity to all the scary things that happen in the world. But rather, when we look at Scripture, we see that in our fears, God uses those moments to draw near into our hearts, to draw near to us and to teach us in a much deeper experience who He is. And He teaches us these lessons through our fears that He never would have taught us or we would never have been able to hear if not for our fears. So a couple of Introductory points here to kind of educate us a little bit, expand our perspective. First of all, uh, these two books are extremely, I highly recommend, we've already recommended Gentle Lowly before, I'll keep recommending it, Uh, extremely helpful book, and Running Scared by Ed Welch, it's about this topic of fear. If you're not a book reader, you can listen to it on audio, I listened to it on audio this week and it's a really easy book to listen to, very helpful books. Fear takes many forms, right? Many forms. Stress, worry, phobias, depression, superstition, anger. And for different different people, we have different understandings of these things. Some of these things, they leap off the list for you and you're like, oh yeah, that's me. Some of us are like, well, what do you mean, you know? So stress, stress is when we have too much expectation put on us than we can deliver, right? Either at work that I have to complete in not enough time or too much expectation for myself that I need to do these things and I'm not living up to those expectations, that's what creates stress. Stress creates fear, right? Worry. Worry, of course, is the number one fear, the the, fear king in our hearts, sort of. We think of all the possible things that can go wrong. People struggle with phobias, right? People are afraid of needles, spiders, snakes, small spaces, dark, whatever it is, right? Lots of different things, and phobias are sometimes tied to people's past experiences. If as a child you got attacked by a dog, you will have a phobia of dogs. I mean, it's not determined, but you may struggle with that, something that you can battle with. Depression actually can be expression of fear because depression is when we battle our fears so much, we fall into hopelessness. We feel like there's no way to control it. Depression can be connected to fear. Superstition is a big one, especially for Russian people, right? If you don't do this, if you don't do that, if you did this, you'll be cursed forever about this other thing. If you commit this sin, then forever you're going to have consequences in this area. God will not not bless you or whatever. People have uh, beliefs that if I do these things, these magical things, then, then these consequences will follow me. I'll be cursed. Anger can be expression of fear, especially for men. Anger, we don't often, oftentimes associate it with fear, but anger in men especially, oftentimes, is, is an expression of a feeling of losing control, a feeling of, uh, the, I, I don't have control and I don't know what to do to regain that control, and I, exp- and I respond with aggressiveness, yelling, being violent, right? Being very busy can be an expression of fear. When I'm afraid that I will not accomplish all the things that I want to accomplish. I push myself. I work nonstop, right? It could be driven by fear. Addiction. Addiction can be caused by fear because we want to escape from our fears to something that will help me feel better, something will help me feel like I'm away from these things that bother me all the time. Panic attacks. Panic attacks are a very interesting phenomenon. Some, if you've seen somebody having a panic attack, it's a physical, it's a body physical response that a person cannot control. Um, at least they can't control it directly. It's a rapid heart rate and uh, very rapid breathing, and a person's entire body tenses up. And panic attacks can be caused by stress and anxiety, but sometimes panic attacks happen in people for no known cause. We don't know why. 
Their body responds with an over, overloaded adrenaline response. Uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors. People can be obsessing about certain things, about germs, about organic food, about all these things that where, where a person is driven by fear of disease or fear of this or fear of that, and so they obsess over a certain thing, perfecting something, going back to it over and over and over and over. can be driven by a fear, trying to prevent something. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, people who've been in terrible situations, right? Fear can trigger this physical response of literally reliving an experience that they had many years ago. And anxiety, of course. Anxiety is a big word today. Anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event, a coming event, or something with uncertain outcomes. A feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. It's interesting, we were talking about anxiety last few months with youth and young people, and it's funny because uh, some young people today are trying to express to their parents that they struggle with anxiety, and in Russian, we don't really have a word for anxiety. We, we have a word for fear, and we have a word for worry, strach, переживание, but anxiety is a word that in Russian we kind of struggle to find uh, an exact uh, synonym for. But that does not mean that Russian people don't struggle with anxiety. They definitely do. It's just something that is usually buried or labeled as something else. A couple of other points here is that, you know, fear can have a variety of causes, right? There's a lot of different ways people, or different reasons people will be afraid. A lot of times it's just our imaginative sinful heart, right? But sometimes it's guilt. Sometimes it could be stress, like we said, sometimes trauma, sometimes your body chemistry, like we were saying in the past, your body has certain imbalances and it throws you into feelings of panic and it's much tougher for some people to control that fear than for others and it's connected to their body. It, and interestingly, uh, according to you know, the, the American um, Association of Depression and Anxiety, the number one diagnosis of Americans in mental health, the number one mental health diagnosis in America, the number one thing that receives attention and medication is anxiety. Affecting up to 40 million adults in the United States ages 18 and older. That's 18 and older only. Obviously, anxiety exists with teenagers. Big time growing problem today, right? But 18% of the population so if, even if you think this is not your problem, which it is, um, this is a problem that is, that is soaked in the culture around us, in the world around us. To be a mission-driven follower of Jesus is, a person, is to be a person who is knowledgeable and who is trying to learn to help people in their fears. That is what it means to be a follower of Christ in our world today, right? So how do we do that? First of all, I want to kind of highlight a few big things about how does fear work in our hearts, right? When we talk about last few weeks, we've been talking about how your heart is the center of who you are, right? You can't just look at your behavior and think, oh, okay, I just need to change my behavior and everything will be better. Our heart is the center of our being. And so we got to, when it comes to fear, we have to observe what is going on in our hearts, right? What is happening? Why does it work this way? First obvious fact, right, is to be human in a broken world is to experience fear. Just because we have temptation and an experience of fear does not mean that something is wrong with us or that we are more broken than somebody else, right? Because we live in a dangerous world and we are weak human creatures, right? And fear, as we will see in a later point, fear is all about uh, losing what you love. It is all about being afraid or protecting the things we love. If you have no fears, you have no loves, and that is not good. People who have zero fears actually have something wrong with their hearts because either they have a problem with attaching and communicating love to other people or something else, some other way that their heart is blocking away being vulnerable. But to live in this world and to love means you will experience the danger of injury, right? God knows this. 
When we look at Jesus in the garden, Jesus was the perfect man. He never sinned. And when you look at Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, as he is about to face the the darkness, as he is about to face the judgment of the Father on behalf of us, as he is about to give his life in payment for our sins, Mark tells us that Jesus was deeply distressed and troubled. Jesus was in in an anxious, fearful state. His fear was not sinful. His fear was directed to the Father. His fear was resulting in leading him into prayer, right? But Jesus was deeply distressed. Mark uses the strongest language to describe Jesus' anxious, suffering, fearful experience. Psalm 55 actually describes the heart of the Messiah as he struggles. So Psalm 55 is is a messianic psalm, and it looks forward, right? And, 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 uh, And it also expresses David. So a lot of these psalms, they'll express two things at the same time, right? But, but David says, my heart shudders within me, terrors of death sweep over me, fear and trembling grip me, horror has overwhelmed me, right? These words are the words of a suffering saint. So most of the things that we fear are good things, uh, threats to good things that we love, right? Our families, our lives. But even though fear is an experience of all of us, we understand also that this experience can grow in a very unhealthy way. It could lead our hearts away from trust in God. It can cause us to turn to our idols, right? And that leads to a second point. Fear is about protecting the things that we love most. As I've mentioned, we've been talking about the heart, right? So true change means change of the heart. Truly understanding your heart means understanding what do you love most? What do you protect? What do you cherish most? When we think about this question, we realize we love a lot of things, right? You, you love many things probably. Good food, sunny weather, time at the park, friends, uh, sleep, you know, a hot bath, a lot of different things that we love, right? But it is not everything that we love that causes us fear, right? Most of our loves, they don't, they don't cause us anxiety, but some of our loves do. Fear and anxiety is, is kind of like a magnifying glass into the heart that highlights the things that you really cherish more than anything else. The things that you become most anxious and fearful about to protect, those are the things that are most likely grasping your heart in a bigger way. Those are the things that are more likely to be your idols, the things that you, that you want to receive peace and satisfaction and joy from when you have these things. These are the things that cause you the most distress when you don't have them, right? That's one of the things that I've highlighted for myself as I was thinking about this subject. It's interesting. I realized, like, if I didn't have a family or if my family died or something happened, right, like, I really, I, as far as I can tell, I'm not really afraid of dying. What I am afraid of is not being able to provide for them. What I realized in myself, my deepest fear, yes, I believe God provides. Yes, I believe God is a father. But my heart, one of the truths that my heart really struggles with is is really believing that God can provide and protect and guide my family better than I can. That he could do it without me. That he could do it just fine without me. That is something that's really hard for me to grasp. That is, that is a love, that is a potential idol that I have to watch, that I have to fight against. I have to believe that God is the one who is in charge. An idol can take a good fear to protect something good, and it can turn into a paralyzing fear. It can distort your life, right? An idol can command you through your fears, It can ruin your relationships. It can ruin your ability to see other parts of your life because you are afraid when you're protecting this, you know? When when a man is was is is feeling like his authority in the home is threatened and he's and he gets angry, right? It, when his idol of pride is hit, it starts to have destruction in many other areas of his life. Or when when parents worry so much about their kids 
that they want to provide for their kids, right? They want their kids to be safe and healthy and growing, but that fear turns into this paralyzing fear that creates tension in the relationship. They start to micromanage. They start to get angry when their kids are late, right? Because that fear fuels, and that fear starts to destroy the relationship. It starts to destroy the kids, and it starts to do the opposite of what the parent wanted. It starts to actually hurt the kids, it's interesting, you see this in the Bible. One of the big characters you see it is in Samuel, or Saul, sorry. Samuel was the prophet. King Saul, we, we remember King Saul as this big, buff, burly dude who was a head taller than everybody. He was the prized number one king of Israel, the first king. But, but Saul's story, when you re- read the, the Old Testament, you see Saul was always, no matter how strong and successful he was, he was always paralyzed by a fear of people. He was always deeply anxious about what other people thought of him. And he admits this fear in 1 Samuel 15, 24. He, he, Samuel is confronting him, said, Saul, you've made a mistake. You've disobeyed God. And he said, you're right. I've, I've, I've transgressed the Lord's command and your words. And he said, because I feared the people, I obeyed them. So his, his fear relieved his, uh, revealed his deepest love, his idol people and their opinion of him, their approval. Fear is also about knowing and controlling the future. We understand that uh, fear is about protecting what we love, right? Protecting ourselves from the dangers. And we realize that fear is something that lives in the future. Fear sees the situation that we're in, and our fear is always trying to predict Our fear is always trying to look ahead. Well, if this happens, then this might happen. If this happens, then these things might result, right? So our fears, they kind of live in the future. They pull us to live in an imagination of our minds in the future. What if this happens? What if this happens? And if this thing happens, then I need to do this, and I need to be ready for this thing, right? As as crazy as it sounds, we know, we know we don't know the future. We know We can't control the future, right? But fears pull us to imagine what could happen. They pull us to imagine, how can I protect myself from these things? What if these people don't like me? What if that person says this about me? How can I protect myself from this? What can I do to feel more security in this other area of my life? Fear always tries to understand what could happen and control the outcomes. Obviously, that is a burden that we can never shoulder. Only God knows the future. But, but that is why fear becomes such a debilitating weight on us, right? We cannot shoulder the burden of knowing the future and predicting it, but we try, and we try to be God, and it kills us. The future has infinite possibilities, right? The future has infinite possibilities, And that is where some of us have experienced that. Your imagination can run wild with fears, right? Some of us, people who who struggle with being paranoid or seeing or overinterpreting, right? A person who is afraid of what other people think of them, a person who maybe is afraid of criticism and negative uh, responses from other people, might be hyper-analyzing how people respond. Oh, that person looked at me like this. This person said this. That probably means this. This person is always trying to predict what they think of him, trying to, trying to get into other people's minds and trying to understand what people think of me, right? What they really think of me. And this oftentimes leads a person to be so confident. Those people hate me. Those people think I'm so dumb. I, this, it piles on, especially if maybe you've experienced negative feedback from somebody, Right? Or a person who's afraid of losing their health. We're afraid of cancer, afraid of death, right? So so we hyper-analyze every little ache and pain, and we Google everything, and and, and our imagination goes wild, and everything is a potential death diagnosis, right? We're thinking ahead into the future. The problem with fear is that all these risks, they are possible. Logically, Technically, it's possible that 
a very mean person, an evil person snuck into the church and planted a bomb, and we don't know about it. I mean, it's logically possible. So because of that, logic by itself doesn't work with fears, right? Fears are logic gone crazy. So if you try to counter people who are struggling with fears with just logic, you realize it just, it's just like pouring gasoline on a fire. It doesn't work. We see this playing out in, in, in Saul's life all the time. Saul is always worried about what might happen if those people might think in this, pe- so he needs to take action. He goes ahead, he, he cuts corners, he goes and visits a witch who, who gives him answers to the spiritual world because he's afraid of what might happen tomorrow. He, he, he takes crazy and foolish and sinful steps to try to take control of the future. And that only increases his fears. And that points to another thing. Uh, fear sees the problem as outside rather than inside, right? When we're afraid, our spotlight is on the world. This fear, that fear, that fear, the, all these different things that can happen to us. Those people, what they said. My bank account, what's going on there? The economy, my business, right? My health. Your mind, your spotlight is focused out. And you're convinced that all the problem lies outside of you. People who struggle with fear or when we are paralyzed by fear, we don't think and we don't want to stop and consider the fact that we are actually looking at the world through a specific lens, right? We don't want to see the lens. We want to see the world. We are confident that we have a correct perspective of the world. That is the pride of our fear, right? Fear says, I have a, right, a correct view of reality. I see all the dangers, and I'm going to try to prevent them. I'm going to try to do what I can to be safe. Fear is too stubborn to admit that it doesn't see everything, right? A person is just following their anxious thoughts, confident of what the things the heart is telling them, but never actually causing, uh, stopping and saying, wait a minute, why am I believing everything that my heart says right now? Why am I so confident that I have a correct view of reality? When you look at the New Testament, we look at the whole Bible, right? The biggest emphasis on spiritual growth is developing your vision, right? It is learning through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the Word, through people in our lives, a wisdom that is a view of reality that is different than we had before, a view of reality that is equipped by God's Spirit and God's wisdom. So, uh, Paul says this in Ephesians 118. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Notice what Paul's saying there. Paul's like, you are saved now. You are Christians. But now I am praying that your eyes continue to be opened more and more to the power that is yours in Jesus. The more you see his power, his presence, the more your vision of reality is changed, the more you, your fears are held in control. But, but when the heart is gripped by fear, it doesn't want to say the problem is the heart. It wants to say problem is the world around me. The problem is those people, those things, that job, that boss, all these scary, pressuring, stressful things around me. The problem is my heart. The problem is my lens, how I see the world. Ed Welch says, warriors are prophets minus the optimism, right? Finally, fear is lonely. Fear isolates, right? When we see that whatever this thing is that's scaring me, this thing, this anxiety, or this worry, and I see that other people, they don't seem to struggle with this same particular worry. I'm the only one. I'm the only one who struggles with this specific thing. It makes us feel disconnected, right? It's very, it's very hard, especially for guys. It's, it's very hard for us to share what we're afraid of. It makes us feel weak. It makes us feel exposed, right? 
And so that, that fear grows inside of our hearts. It, it's a very lonely experience, especially people with anxiety who, who suffer with anxiety. They, they, they feel like their whole world is just quicksand, right? This feeling of anxiousness, this tension in the stomach, these butterflies that don't go away. But everybody else seems to be so calm, right? And when a person sees that, they feel isolated. They feel more and more completely alone, like they're the only ones and that everybody else is fine. It's interesting that the mental health world, psychologists, psychiatrists, the response to fear kind of basically has two sides to it in the mental health world. Men meditation and medication, right? Meditation is basically like, close your eyes and think of a nice place. For most of us, it's a beach, a tropical beach with warm water lapping at our feet and the sun shining. I mean, that's nice. That might calm your symptoms for the moment, but it's actually teaching you to look away from the things you're fearing. And the harder you try to do that, the harder you try to not think about your fears, the more you think about your fears, right? Your heart still doesn't believe that the world is safe just because you envision a warm beach. Your heart still needs real answers, right? Real answers about all these things that we're afraid of. Or medication. We just need to calm the body, calm the heart rate, relax the mind, relax the brain, right? Medications associated with anxiety and panic attacks especially can be pretty addicting. And they just calm the physical. And some people, they need to take that. They need to take, because their body is so worked up, they need help calming the symptoms down so that they, they could deal with the heart. But if it's just medication, 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 it's not teaching your heart anything. It's not teaching your heart a solution to our fears. What we really need in our fears is not just an answer, right? We don't just need some three steps. We don't just need some idea or some logical explanation. What we really need in our fears is a person, right? We see that in the beautiful simplicity of a child and their fears of the dark, right? As long as dad's here, as long as mom's here, as long as my stuffy animal's here, I'm good. There's something about our soul that craves the presence of another in fear that truly leads to peace and, and calm, right? And we understand that, especially when you're struggling with specific kinds of fears, you understand that, yeah, this person might love me, give me a hug, pray with me, but like nobody can really give me true peace other than God. And so we want to see and take a moment here to see how does God speak into our fears? How does God, seeing these heart struggles that we just kind of isolated, how does God relate to this? What's God's relationship to fears? The biggest thing in fear is our view of God. The biggest treatment, the biggest way that we battle fear, it starts with what we just said earlier, a person, and specifically your actual view of God. And I'm not talking about your theology that you would just say with your, with your lips, yes, God is all-powerful, wise, loving, He is in control of the world, and He has a good plan for me. No. When I'm talking about your view of God, I'm talking about your actual experience of who He is in your heart. I'm talking about your mind and your heart connecting on the truth of who he is. The thing about fears and anxieties that is uh, as, as, as terrible of a subject as it is, this subject is really awesome because it highlights, it brings to the surface the most beautiful and amazing passages from Scripture. If you just ask this question, how does the Bible speak to our fears? You literally have a hard time flipping two pages through your Bible without the Bible addressing fear. God is constantly addressing, God is constantly speaking into our fears. And that's something that we need to hear, we need to know. When I'm in the middle of fearing or being anxious or being stressed, God feels distant. Does He care? Is He present? What, what, is, what, is, what is his relationship? Does he know that I'm really suffering here? Does he know that I'm really struggling with this? He seems to be really checked out. He seems to be really far away, right? 
Does God care about my fears? And one way to answer this question is to actually ask another question. And I think I've mentioned this before too in sermons. We've, we've heard this. But what is the number one command in the Bible? The number one command in the Bible. The command that is repeated over and over more than any other command in the Bible. I'm not talking about what is the most important command. That is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know that. But what is the command that is repeated more times than any other command? It's not be strong, it's not be holy, it's not obey, it's not be faithful. The, the number one command that the Bible repeats over and over is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. This is the thing that God says to us more than any other thing. He says, do not be afraid. It is all over the Bible. It is everywhere. We heard it in the beautiful passage that Max read. When the, the psalmist is, is, is struggling, he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. And then later he says, when I'm with you, I will not be afraid. And then he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. So he's, he's battling. He knows he's fearing, but he knows that in God, he has nothing to fear. One of the beautiful passages that jumps to my heart, my mind about this this subject is Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 4. Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 4. If you have a Bible, open it. I just read it out loud for us right now. Now this is what the Lord says. The one who created you, Jacob. The one who formed you, Israel. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. And you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And the rivers will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, and your Savior. I have given Egypt as a ransom for you, Cush and Seba in your place. Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. It's a beautiful passage where God is comforting his people. And you might say, well, yeah, that's to Israel, He's talking about historic stuff. No, he says, when, when God in the Old Testament says things to Israel, he's speaking to his people. And in the New Testament, we see we are the true Israel, right? The church, his redeemed people. This is his words to us in the midst of our fears. And notice how there's a few things that we can see here that, that reveal God, right? First of all, the simple thing that we need to see here is that God is present in our fears, right? I am with you. You are mine. And we might say, yeah, well, God is everywhere. God is God. He's omnipresent, He's in control of everything. No, that's not what he's saying here, right? He says, in your fears, in the things that scare you, in the things that plague your heart, I am with you in the midst of those fears in a very intentional and personal and special way. I am with you. I am present in a way I want you to feel. I want you to experience my love my arms around you, my guiding presence, my assuring and peaceful hand. Dane Ortland beautifully says this. He says, if you are in Christ, you have a friend who in your sorrow and your fear, he will never lob down a pep talk from heaven. He cannot bear to hold himself at a distance. Nothing can hold him back. His heart is too bound up with yours. When Jesus Christ sees the fallenness of our world all around him, in his deepest impulse, it is his most natural instinct to move toward our suffering, our pain, our fear, not to be pushed away from it, right? That's what God says to Israel here. Israel is afraid, anxious, distracted, foolish, God says, listen to me. Do not fear. I am with you. 
I am going to be with you through it. God wants to speak into our fearful moments and he wants us to hear his, his presence. But not only that, he wants us to hear that he understands our fear, right? Think about this. God commands that we do not fear. And, and when we read this text, we realize this is not a, don't be scared. That's not, that's not what he's saying, right? Do not fear is not, do not fear. It's, do not fear. There's a different kind of command. God comes to us in our fears with a deep sympathy and compassion. He is not floating up in heaven in sovereign glory saying, ah, you little insects, you're so weak, and so afraid. Don't you know I'm in charge? God speaks to us in fear more than anything else. Think about it. It is his priority to note that you are afraid and to tell you words of assurance. He understands the fear that grips our hearts. He understands not just because he's all-knowing, not just because he's a compassionate and amazing God, but also he knows what it's like to be afraid. We just noted that earlier, right? God entered our world, became human, became frail, and in Jesus, God faced ultimate doom and darkness. God faced the scariest thing that any human being can ever face, his own wrath. And he was terrified. God understands our pain. He understands our fear. And that, that's why he speaks into it constantly, constantly, constantly. Don't be afraid. I'm here. Don't be afraid. I know. Don't be afraid. I am the Lord your God. Psalm 22 captures the, the heart of the Messiah. This is, this, is, this is the heart of Jesus in the garden. They opened their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting inside of me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. The tongue, my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. The terror of the garden, the terror of Calvary that Jesus faced is a fear that we will never have to face. And it is a fear that causes him to know that we are afraid. He understands. Not only that, God is sovereignly guiding and he's providing. He's present to guide us. Notice these beautiful words. When you pass through the waters, when you pass through the fire, the rivers will not rise against you. You will not be scorched. I will be with you. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine because you are precious in my sight and I love you. God is not just saying that to be poetic or cute, right? This is the heart of God. We may ask this question, what is God doing, right? What is God, uh, we understand God is running the universe and controlling everything and leading nations and controlling the weather and all these things we understand God is God, right? But, but at, at the center of all he's doing, what is he really doing? What is, what is the focus of God in his heart, in his affections? What is the thing that most occupies his heart? When we look at scripture, when we look at this passage in Isaiah, when we look at Jesus and his story, we see that God is doing one main thing. God is putting his glory on display by loving and leading his people. That is what he is doing. He is loving and he is leading his people. That is the center of God's plan. That is the focus of all his energy throughout all of history. God is focused on this goal to love and to lead his people. This is the greatest way he is putting his glory on display, right? We know God puts his glory on display through the weather, the mountains, the, the things he does, the nations he, he controls, right? But at the end of the day, the most beautiful thing Paul tells us in Ephesians, this is the proclamation of God's wisdom and glory, his love for his church, his love for his people. He is loving and leading weak and foolish sinners, and he's loving and leading them to himself, to his power, to his love. 
This is the whole story of the gospel. This is the whole story of the Christian life, right? God came into the world. He came into this world. Jesus died in our place. Jesus rose from the grave so that he could destroy that wall that separates us between our creator, that wall, that our sin, our guilt, our foolishness, our rebellion. He came to break that wall. Why? To make us be with him. For him to be with us. For him to love us, to guide us, to teach us to live with him so that he may never let us go. That's the whole point of the whole story of the gospel. When we as Christians would think about the future, all the risks and all the scary things. When you think about the future, the future is not just some formless void of scary things that can happen to me and my kids. The future is being written by a loving, powerful Savior who died for you, who is making you brand new, who is redeeming the whole world, and he's going to place you in that new creation to live with him forever. The whole future is in his hands, and he is writing it. He is writing your story. Yes, it is scary, right? Yes, it is difficult. Yes, it is challenging. There is blood and there is death and there is suffering. But this whole story, he is leading the way to a redemption, to a beautiful solution. So we have hope. Do we believe this about God, these things? Do we believe these things about God? Does our heart, when we look at the gospel, does that fill our heart with this surge of wonderful confidence? Of course, it doesn't doesn't extinguish our fears or it doesn't take away all of our worries. But, But does this story fill us with joy and power? Romans 8.31, what can we say to these things? If God is for us, then who is against us? He who did not even spare his own son, but gave himself for up, For us all, how will he not with him grant us everything else? Who can bring an accusation against us, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more was risen. He also is at the right hand of God, and he is interceding for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? No, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do we believe this about God? Does the gospel fill us with a deeper experience of what is God doing? God is drawing near through Jesus. And he is teaching me to rest in him, to trust in him, right? The battle with fear, the problem with fear, you know, our heart is so restless, we're so noisy, we don't stop and listen. Right? That's why God says in the Psalms, be still and know that I'm God. First thing to battling our fears is just stop and listen. Stop listening to our heart and stop and listen and hear Jesus. His death, his victory, his life, his power, his care for us, right? The real story is so much bigger than the things you fear. Yes, our fears are real, but there's a bigger story even beyond our our fears. Our Savior, He is working in the world. He is fighting. He is killing Satan and his powers. He is putting to death sin and evil. And through us, He is spreading the beauty of His good news, His kingdom, reconciliation, new life. This this story is so beautiful. It'll, It'll take your breath away. But if you learn to pause and listen, hear God. And when we hear God, when we listen to God, we also respond a little bit differently. We learn to live today. That's the other practical thing that we have to do. Learn to focus on the battles of today, not tomorrow. We want to be God. We want to see the whole picture. We want to see the whole plan. We want to see all the steps, right? But God... God knows that. He knows that we're twisted and our hearts are deceitful. He will give us only enough manna for today. That's the point of the story of manna in the wilderness. Why did God give them manna for today? Why did he say, don't save up for tomorrow? Because he knew that if they saved up a bunch of manna, they wouldn't come to God the next morning. 
in His grace, He is providing us only enough for today because He wants to teach you to come back tomorrow. Because He wants to teach you that the, even more important than Him providing manna for you is Him teaching you to come to Him. That's what He's really doing. Every day, God is calling us to walk in obedience. Every day, we face certain dangers, certain challenges in our faith, right? Certain callings, faithfulness, right? Every day, we learn to focus on what he put right in front of us and say, Lord, help me here. Help me in these challenges today. Provide me with strength. Give me answers. Give me the wisdom to lead my family. Give me to, the ability to love my neighbor, to battle my sin today. And then at the end of the day, look back. Look what he did. Then the next morning, start over. Because fear, this is, and this is where we see the danger of fear. When you live in the future, fear wants to pull you into the imaginary future. It is robbing you of today. Fear wants you to not see what God is doing today. Fear wants you to not learn about what God wants to teach you today. Fear does not want, to, doesn't want you to see his power displayed today. Fear wants you to live in the imaginary future and to be unfaithful to the things that you are called to do today. It robs you of God's power because God's power is today, not for tomorrow. Tomorrow will have its own battles. Tomorrow will need its own new faith. Fear robs you of your actual opportunity to experience God by pulling you into the future. God calls you today. Worry about today. Tomorrow is another battle. Ask for help and see and expect him to provide. And finally, when we see God, when we hear God in the midst of our fears, we have to learn the courage of the gospel, right? We have to learn to stand and fight. The gospel is not just about giving you peace to kind of sort of make it through, right? Jesus is not that kind of Lord. He is a Lord who owns everything, and he is putting his power on display through our lives, and he wants his joy and his power and his confidence to burst forth from our hearts and our lives. The interesting thing, you know, the challenging thing about fear is that when you trust God, when you come to God, when you rest in God, right, bad things will still probably happen. He's not going to make everything, all your challenges go away. He still, you still will experience pain and struggle, right? And the temptation is that, well, well, God is not powerful enough, not strong enough to take away all this suffering from my life. Why can't he just do it, right? And that's the very opposite of the truth. The truth is, he is even more powerful. He is doing something even bigger. He doesn't want to just take away your pain and suffering and your, 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 your fears. God is wanting to teach us in the midst of our fears to be victorious, he wants to teach us in the midst of our fears, like Paul says, more than conquerors in all these things. In the midst of nakedness, famine, peril, Paul says, in the midst of these things, in the, I will be more than conquerors because of Christ and his strength that is at work in me. John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you, so that in me you may have peace you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. He says, you will have suffering. You will have pain. You will have fear, right? But Jesus says, be courageous. I have overcome the world. I have conquered the world, right? The promises of Scripture, they're not just meant to be hanging on our walls or in our Instagram feeds, right? The promises of the gospel they're supposed to be like cement under your feet in the midst of a storm. They're supposed to be like rebar in concrete, holds it up and makes it strong. The promises of God are real. They're strong enough. You could stand on them. You could jump on them, right? You could swing with them. You can cause damage with the promises of God, damage to sin, to darkness, to Satan, to evil things, right? Fear wants to be 
ignoring God's promises. You might say, yeah, I know God's in control. Yeah, like I read these Bible verses. I'm still anxious. Fear wants to be stubborn and to not let the promises of God be real, right? When we look at the gospel of Christ, when we look at everything that God is doing, we have to, we have to realize, yes, what do I do with my fears? I don't ignore them. Yes, I am afraid. Yes, terrible things can happen. How would I face them? I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But what I do know, what I do know is that there is a God who has victory over death and who has victory over resurrection. This God is at work in my life. This God has given me the good news. He has given me lungs, a body, a life to proclaim, to live that good news. And he has called me into that battle, right? Jesus runs before us into this broken world. But Jesus wants us to learn from him. He wants us to get the courage of his strength to get us into the battle. He wants us to live with joy and courage in the midst of our fears. He provides the grace. He provides the power. So, so in fear, we don't shrink back, and we don't just try to get through. We need to learn to stand up and fight. We need to, we need to ask, does Jesus inspire me to live? Not just survive my fears, but live in the midst of my fears and say, yes, these things are scary, but Jesus is scarier, and he is my king. He is my Lord. Paul says in Titus, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in the suffering of the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us, and he has called us with a holy calling, not according to works, but according to his purpose and his grace, which he has given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of their Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Paul says, have power, have strength, not fear, because look at this amazing story. So a couple of questions as we pray, as we reflect. What are my deepest fears? What are the things that I'm afraid of? We love a lot of things, but we're not afraid for all those things. Certain things make us more afraid than others. How do I respond to my fears? Have I ever thought about my response to my fears? Have I ever paused and thought, hmm, I tend to respond like this. I tend to respond by thinking that my fears are so big and scary, but I don't ever bring it to the Lord. I don't bring it into his presence. Does my fear and my worry, does it dominate my landscape, my mental landscape? Or do I constantly bring the story of the gospel into my fears? The fight of the gospel, the victory of the gospel, the promise of the gospel. Do I allow the truth of God's presence and faithfulness to sink deep into my heart? This is, this is, this is, this is the foundation of everything, right? Many of us this week, we got to sit in this. We got to soak in this, right? We got to tell God, Lord, help me to know this truth better because I know it's true, but I'm still afraid or I'm still anxious or I'm still untrusting of you. Help me to see it more. Some of us this week, we need to go back to the story of the gospel. We need to go back through all these passages that we've been reading today. You can find the notes in the app. It's all there, right? Read through the passages, the beauty of the gospel, the power of Jesus at work in us. Does that sink into our hearts? Are, are, are you surrounded by the love of Christ in your life? Do you experience that love? Do you rest in that love? God did not mean to give you these truths so that they just float away, right? God wants you to know how much he loves you. Do you constantly live in the future? Do you constantly live in the possibilities, 
in the endless imagination of what could happen? Or are you pulling yourself into the present? Are you saying, Lord, teach me today. Teach me to fight today. Teach me to see what is my calling today as a father, as a husband, as a neighbor, as a brother, as a sister, as a classmate, as a coworker. Everywhere that I go, you have surrounded me with battlefields, with callings. Teach me today to be faithful to you. Give me strength for today. You will see. When you learn to pray this way, you will see day by day his providence. Day by day, he is present, right? Day by day, he is empowering. I, I, to my shame, so often, I'm learning to pray like this. I'm learning, and, and, and to my shame, I'll, I'll be praying in the beginning or middle of the day, Lord, help us, guide us, strengthen us, right? And at the end of the day, I often forget to be like, whoa, that happened. Like, it actually happened. God answered. Does the beauty of the gospel fill us with courage? Many times, maybe we don't connect these dots. Uh, The gospel of Jesus must give you courage. It must give you fire in your lungs, right? It must make you want to fight. Fight against sin. Fight against brokenness. Fight against darkness. Fight against the right things, not the wrong things. Not fight for ourselves, for our pleasure, for our comfort, for our pride, Do you have patience and compassion on people who suffer with fears? If somebody is sharing with you their fears, their worries, listen and be patient and be compassionate because it is very difficult to share our fears with other people, right? Oftentimes we don't know how to do that. Just be the comfort of Christ to people. When they tell you what they're afraid of, when they tell you what they're worried about, listen. Tell them that sounds difficult, that sounds challenging. Tell them, ask them how you can help. Pray for them. Remind them of the truth, right? Listen. And if you are a person who struggles with fears in a specific kind of way, learn to bring people in. Jesus is giving you love and strength through the saints, through the people that he is saving, right? He holds you up. He gives you power through the people he sends in your life. Learn to share that. Learn to welcome people. Just say, as, as something as simple as, you know, I have this problem with worrying about my family or my finances. Just pray for me, you know? It's not a big deal. Not something I need to go wail and cry about. Just let people in. Welcome the, the, the prayers of the people around us. What can we say to these things, Paul says? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, rulers, things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are such a present and patient father to us, Lord. You speak into our quivering and anxious hearts, even though so often we do not even listen. You are the father who continually speaks truth, continues to guide, continues to provide, continues to protect, Lord, even when we're not even looking, even when we're not noticed, even when we're too distracted to hear you, Lord. Teach us to to be still in our midst of our fears. Teach us to come before your mighty presence, to, to feel the trembling wonder of your power and glory, and to know that you are our Father. Lord, teach us to live as children who who walk with you, who know that you are with us, Lord. Teach us in the midst of our fears to fight. We confess, Lord, that we are frightened often, that we are not in control of our lives, that we respond to fear incorrectly oftentimes, Lord. We get distracted and anxious, and we turn to false promises, false idols to give us a sense of security, Lord. Teach us to to see how empty those things are. Teach us to turn to you. When we are afraid, teach us to turn.
turn to you. Teach us to speak to you, Lord. Teach us to focus on what you have put right in front of us and to ask you to show your glory, to show your presence. Help us to be empowered. Help our eyes to be opened to your amazing goodness to us in Christ Jesus. Amen.